ask anyone about Liverpool in the 60s and the chances are the first thing they'll say is the Beatles. It's true that the four-man rhythm and blues combo that first played here at what was the original Cavern Club on the 21st of February 1961 went on to be the biggest band in the world. They changed the shape of popular music and put just one place on everyone's lips, Liverpool. But this film is not just about the Beatles, far from it. It's about a city that's on the up, alive with passion and pride, and setting new standards for everyone else to follow. The 60s were a time of great change for Merseyside. The whole area looked to the future with a fresh new air of self-confidence, a greater understanding of its strengths, and a solid determination to succeed. A major rebuild policy was generating new opportunities out of the devastation caused by the German bombers of World War II. A new youth culture was beginning to make its mark with bright new ideas and creativity. The city was buzzing with activity and the docks on both sides of the Mersey were packed to overflowing. Birkenhead docks were handling around 3 million tonnes of imports and 1.5 million tonnes of exports every year. And at Liverpool, demand was so great that over £20 million was spent on reconstructing the Langdon and Canada docks. And Her Majesty the Queen was there to open them in 1962. The docks, well, everyone was working in Liverpool. They all worked on the docks. All the wagons were down here, team horse and carts, steam wagons, the end of the steam wagons. Everyone worked, two men on a wagon, great. You shifted everything by hand, there was no cranes, there was nothing outside the docks yard here. You'd done it with your mate and you lifted it and you'd done your job by hand. There was no computers and whatever it is we've got today that can kill the jobs. This pub, the Atlantic, on a dock road, is one of my favourite Liverpool pubs. It's quiet at the moment. But well, I can remember being in this pub in the 60s when it was absolutely packed with dockers. And this is during the middle of the day. <laughs> Don't ask me what they're doing in here instead of being on the docks. That's not my business. <laughs> All I know is that they were in and they were part of a thriving port. This was, as far as, far as we were concerned in Liverpool, the greatest port in the world. Bar none, New York, not in the make specs with Liverpool. Everybody was full of confidence, everybody was working, and of course the dockers not only were working, but they were also getting very, very well paid, you know, by working class standards. And this pub, as I say, was a centre of that being on the dock road. It was absolutely terrific. I mean, the dockers have always been, and still are today, a very special breed of people. They've got a... They've got the, uh, a double dose of the traditional sense of humour, if you like. And I can remember in this very pub, Jimmy Tarbuck, who in the 60s, of course, was in the very early stages of his career. He'd just been uh, on the London Palladium, and he'd done brilliantly, and we were all made up for him as well. But I can remember Jimmy Tarbuck being in this pub, list just listening to the Dockers talk, and he'd write down little notes. And it was nothing unusual, a couple of weeks later, on the London Palladium, to hear the same words that you'd heard in this very pub and pubs like it on the dock road. And that's how important Liverpool was in the 60s. That's how important the docks were in the 60s. This was the centre of the world. From the Atlantic to the Atlantean, Merseyside's rickety old buses were more than ready to be pensioned off. And in 1962, the city took delivery of its brand new fleet of Atlantean super luxury buses. Seen here on the streets of Wallasey, the new double deckers were put into service just in time for the Christmas rush. The car workers of Merseyside have put millions of cars on Britain's roads. This was the very first. Job number one on the 8th of May 1963 with the Lord Mayor David Lewis at the wheel. Merseyside was also leading the field politically. A Labour stronghold for almost two generations, it owed a good deal of its strength to a young man born in Huddersfield but raised in Liverpool. 
Elected to Parliament in 1945, two years later, at the age of 31, he became the youngest cabinet minister this century, and in 1964 overturned a massive Conservative majority and won the keys to 10 Downing Street. The MP for Highton, Harold Wilson. Harold came down very frequently and held his surgeries. Mm. We had a lot of Liverpool housing stock. Mm. It wasn't a, I know 20 years, but it wasn't a great time after the war. We had lots and lots of problems, and especially with mm. housing and people needing housing and young mm. families, children. But there was this father figure there, Harold. If you had a problem, mm -hmm. he solved it. And that was the feeling. I'd hate to say he, was, he felt like God mm. Almighty, but there was that feeling amongst people. Well, and there was God. a eu euphoria, but I think, you know, problems about unemployment. He said, right, what we'll do, we'll bring Ford Motor Company here, won't we? And he got Ford Motor Company brought here, as you probably know. But it was, it was, was there this, were good times, was, the 60s. Do you remember he used to, at the election, he, he used to come here and he used to wander down the road, and he said, God, old Haddle, that's yes. right, you know. And he was spoken. the Prime Minister. But, you know, he was wandering down, smoking his pipe and so on. And, uh, the special branch Arthur, used to be and there. And Arthur Smith, who had bad feet, used to be with him. <laughs> <laughs> Did you remember going, come on, Arthur, go on. He God. was a man of the people. Wilson was certainly no fool. In 1965, Liverpool's adopted son honoured four other Liverpudlians with the MBE. The 60s also saw the making of Notty Ash's biggest star. Ken Dodd was knocking them dead with sell-out summer seasons and packed Christmas specials. Here he is with the Tiller girls, helping out with the Christmas rush at the Liverpool sorting office. The Beatles were just part of the explosion of creative talent on Merseyside during the 60s. Groups of talented young writers and performers gathered to discuss ideas and to make their mark on the arts. The city undoubtedly provided some of the country's most gifted poets since the war. Three of the most talented were Roger McGough, Brian Patton and Adrian Henry. There is obviously something about Liverpool. That there is, it is one of those places where things happen and almost despite the the obvious problems, you know, but um, somehow or other, there's always something going on, there's always something interesting. And the, for instance, the reason I came here was because in the late 50s it was uh, very much a, an artist town, it was painters and sculptors. And, and there was a whole crowd of us who used to live in this district that I still live in and go to the same pub and so on. And it was very much like the sort of left bank in Paris or something. And so Really, there's always a, you felt there's always this town has always got something happening in it, and the poetry really was the kind of the new thing that happened, I suppose, in 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 the sixties, because it didn't necessarily have a, a major kind of poetry tradition before that. And what happened really was that I, well, there were three three of us who people know about. Um, Brian Patton had just left school um, with no O levels at age fifteen and was working as a cub reporter on the Bootle Times. Uh, Roger McGough had just come back from Hull University with a degree in French, and he was going to do some teaching. And I was teaching at Manchester Art College, and commuting over to Manchester, because I didn't, didn't like Manchester, wanted to stay in Liverpool. And I guess it's the Irish, and maybe the Welsh tradition. I mean, it's a Celtic city, isn't it, really? Um, I mean, both Ireland and Wales, I mean, they are very much places about words and songs and music. Um, and I guess also, I suppose, West Indian. You know, it's a great tradition of storytelling and things. So somehow all the, all the elements in the mixture that makes up most people here, I mean, are, are very much word conscious and, and the famous sense of humour, obviously. Um, I mean, you have to open your ears and listen any time, you know, on the bus or whatever. And, you know, people just say amazing things. No one perhaps more amazing than Adrian himself, who along with Roger McGough and John Gorman was pushing back the boundaries of 60s theatre at Hope Hall. The first event we did was called City, and we tried to portray a sort of instant cityness, sort of um, a confusion of images, uh, of sounds, smells, music, action, words, um, which would give us a sort of essence of city. And um, we used uh, some local dancers, not professional dancers, but more people who rather enjoy twisting and jiving and tend to do it rather well.
Not surprisingly, with all that creativity around, the theatre was enjoying something of a boom time, especially here in Hope Street, where the old Hope Hall was transformed by three students from Birmingham University into the Everyman. It was a, a few students from Birmingham who started the theatre, and they wanted to do exciting theatre um, cha and change the world. Uh, the way students like to. Um, Terry Hans is the is the director of the RSC. Peter James is the director of the Lyric Theatre. I think it's special because it's always been a people's a people's theatre. You don't have to get you don't have to get dressed up. You just come casual, comfortable. I don't mean scruffy. Do you know what I mean? Um, relaxed. As far as I know, uh, the biggest success was John McGraw's Soft or a Girl. Um, and they also had a big success with John, George, Paul, Ringo and Bert, one of Willie Russell's. Trevor Eve as Paul, Philip Joseph as George, Anthony Cher as Ringo, and Bernard Hill as John. An impressive cast. The Playhouse underwent extensive alterations, gaining an attractive new restaurant, coffee lounge and buttery bar. The Playhouse's success was truly international. The whole company travelled to Florence in Italy with a production of Willis Hall's The Long and the Short and the Tall. Other big box office tours to visit the Playhouse were The Spinners, Sooty with Harry Corbett and John Osborne's Look Back in Anger. Tickets for the theatre started at around 8 bob, or 40p. Unlike the theatre, tragedy in real life means great pain, and it would be impossible to ignore one of the decade's most heartbreaking mistakes, thalidomide. One of Britain's greatest wartime heroes, Group Captain Douglas Bader, who lost both his legs in the Second World War, is seen here visiting some of the young thalidomide victims at Alderhay Hospital. Merseyside in the 60s meant build, and build it big. Some of the most memorable developments, and those that perhaps have had the greatest effect on the area, involved the need to prepare the city for increasing demands from traffic and the population. Plans were afoot for both Liverpool and Birkenhead to get a new shopping centre, but both were to have their problems. In Liverpool in 1964, work began on demolishing St John's Market, originally opened in 1822. The old market was cleared to make way for a £10 million St John's Precinct project. Work was expected to be completed by November 67, but a series of problems and hold-ups kept putting the opening date further and further back until the now famous beacon still being fitted, the car park and the hotel unfinished, and a hundred thousand over target, it was finally opened in April 1970. At the same time in Birkenhead, an inquiry had investigated the need for a new shopping centre in the Grange Road area, and that was given the green light. Work also began on one of Liverpool's most remarkable buildings, the Roman Catholic Cathedral. A vast concrete conical arena surmounted by a multicoloured concrete and glass crown with 50-foot high pinnacles of fibreglass. It's a building that always creates a reaction. As the Archbishop of Liverpool, the late Most Reverend George Beck said at the time of its consecration in 1967, you can love it or you can loathe it, but you can't ignore it. The design tender attracted over 300 entries from all over the world, but the winning design was one from much-respected Britain, Sir Frederick Gibbard. On the horticultural side of things, 1964 saw the opening of the Liverpool Botanic Gardens. Over 36,000 square feet of glass, costing £100,000, and home for more than 10,000 exotic plants. The fame of Merseyside's music scene was spreading all over the world. Something special was happening in the city. It was a time of such great change that it left an indelible mark on the entire century. In the 60s, the Beatles weren't the only young people in Liverpool, of course. The city was throbbing with what's now called a youth culture. We didn't know it was a youth culture then. We were just part of it. And everybody wanted to be a Beatle. And I've, I don't know how many groups there were in Liverpool in the 60s, but I know that it runs into hundreds. 
everybody wanted to be a Beatle, everybody wanted to be in a band, and m most people were. And it didn't really matter whether you, <laughs> whether you could play or not. <laughs> that wasn't the point. <laughs> you were in a band, you were connected with the scene in some way. I mean, if you couldn't play in a band, you'd go and you'd listen to a band. You could walk around the city centre in Liverpool, you could walk down Dale Street, go down Temple Lane, Temple Street, and the sounds coming out of the clubs, it was, it was quite unbelievable. Because it wasn't disco music, it, they were live bands. It was young people in Liverpool being creative. You could be on Lime Street and it was commonplace to see young people coming out of Lime Street Station. Not young Scousers, but young people from other parts of the country, from Edinburgh, from Carlisle, from Newcastle, from Colchester, from Southend. And all they wanted to do was be in Liverpool and hear the Liverpool accent. In fact, when I look back now, that trip that they made from all over Britain to Liverpool in the 60s, really, it, it was kind of a, a holy pilgrimage. I was what you call Canard Yank years ago, in the 60s, early 60s, when we just come down and, you know, point liners deliver it down to the, the bar. We used to pick the pilot up. The first guy on board was the pilot. Then you get down as far as the bar. You may be a rough seas, you couldn't go come into delivery. You had to wait until the side went out or whatever. And then we get the next person on board was your customs men. Well, my father, my brother always comes to meet me on docking day, because they always had dock a bottle there and a couple of packets of ciggies, whatever it was, they was guaranteed they'd be on, on before the custom fellas. How they done it, I'll never know. They always seem to do it to get there no matter what time, in the morning, afternoon, night, any time at all, they were on board that year. Like I said, as soon as we get time off, off the ship, we'll get ashore and we'll get down the pier head. We'll go to the dive, the dars, the Spanish house, the, um, there's another one called the Long Roundabout, the Casey's, we say they had in Casey Street. They were all our locals. One thing about the town, if you, 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 always, you run out of money, but you wouldn't run out of a pint. Because the, the lads were all sound, all scousers, they were all, all good lads. And even, even the barman, you know, you know you'd come back, you'd, you'd have a few bob. You'd be in their position one day and you'd look after them. You'd, so you know, you'd always got a pint in town, like, you know, so that was our boozers. This is Temple Street, where the other famous underground Liverpool cellar, the Iron Door Club, was. Many, many years ago, other famous bands, like Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, Neil Preston and the TTs, uh, Cass and the Casanovas, which became the big three, all played in this cellar. And at the time, 1961, they held auditions for groups to go to France on the American bases. Everybody had to have uh, Gale singers. And it's just a general raving place, all night sessions, lunchtime sessions, no alcohol. All the bands all met up. Once the Beatles recorded uh, Sergeant Pepper, then everything got a bit crazy because nobody could take that type of show out on the road and play to an audience. And then the onset of the discos didn't help the live bands at all, really. Uh, guitar solos got longer, bands got louder, wanted bigger equipment, drummers got crazier. One of the reasons for the increase in youth culture during the 60s was undoubtedly the university. During the decade, it doubled its numbers of students. And here, just a stone's throw away from the old art school and the institute, now being turned into the Liverpool Institute of Performing Arts, is a pub that's well and truly on the tourist map. The Crack. It was here that a young John Lennon and Stu Sutcliffe were tempted by a swift half or two. Hmm. However, the city fathers had more sober thoughts on their minds, improving the area's roads. <laughs> traffic was getting more and more congested on both sides of the Mersey and plans were drawn up to link city planning with solutions to transportation problems. The Merseyside Passenger Transport Executive was set up to improve and coordinate local transportation throughout the area. In June 1965, Parliament approved a £4 million scheme to improve the approaches to the tunnel and as this rare helicopter footage shows, work was well underway on the area's motorways. Port 2 was preparing itself for an increase in traffic. 
In 1966, the same year that the Hawker Harrier jump jet was launched, the Duke of Edinburgh opened and piloted the first aircraft to use the new 7,500-foot runway at Speak. Recognised as one of the most advanced runways in Europe, it was another clear sign that the rest of the world looked to Liverpool when they wanted to trade with Britain. Jaguar had not long since launched their 155 miles per hour sports car, the E-Type. And if you were rich enough, you could pick one up for a massive £2,196. But if that was a little out of your budget, Speak was also home for the standard Triumph motor car factory, which was working flat out when the Prime Minister took a guided tour. Dr. Shivago, starring Omar Sharif, was breaking all the box office records at the cinema, whilst on the small screen everyone was glued to Warren Mitchell as Alf Garnet in Till Death Us Do Part. And hours of entertainment could be found here at the Wizard's Den, one of Liverpool's oldest and best-loved shops, which sold every joke known to man. Talking of shops, here are some of the bargains that could be picked up in the high street. Manweb could centrally heat your home for just 49 guineas. A 19-inch TV in teak cabinet was 78 guineas. Bebbington Motors of Birkenhead, Liverpool and Queensferry were offering a Fiat van for £380. Austin House on Hanover Street had an 1100 for £592. A Cambridge at £720 and a Mini for just £447. A GT305 Eccles Caravan was only £285. And just look at these American Express holidays. How's about 15 days in Italy for 26 and a half guineas? Samsung cameras on Bold Street had the world's most advanced camera, the Polaroid 100 Automatic, for £114, 12 and 6. Christmas spirit flowed freely with price tags like 19 and 6 for a gay sparkling muscatel or La Flora Blanche for 15 and 9. And following the financial crisis in Bonn at the end of the decade, there was outcry when the Chancellor announced that cigarettes would go up to 3 and 5 for 20 and petrol 4 and 4 a gallon. A two-bedroom luxury flat in Wallasey with views of the sea and Snowdonia was £4,250 or £2,750 in Upton. On the pitch, it was a marvellous decade for both the Merseyside teams. The rivalry was as strong as ever, but as always, with good humour. Here, Gordon West is presented with a handbag by a member of the cop after he'd blown them a kiss. West wasn't pleased. It didn't match his gloves. The roll of honours shows just how much Liverpool and Everton dominated British soccer. The 1962-63 season, Everton were league champions. 63-64, it was Liverpool's turn. They had to run around the pitch with a cardboard cutout of the cup. They went on the following year to win the FA Cup. And in the 65-66 season, Liverpool were champions again, with Everton winning the FA Cup. And in 69-70, during the last match of the season, Everton lifted the title. Well, uh, I'd uh, watched Everton from a lad, 1946, right up to 1960. They'd never won anything, so I wasn't an Evertonian because Everton were winning. They never won nothing till 1963. But I was born an Evertonian, and I was born in Everton, Liverpool 5, in the district of Everton, at the best half where they had bay windows on the houses. But we still went to see Liverpool on the other Saturday that we never seen Everton. But 1963 was my uh, heyday, and 1966. Uh, Alec Young, Vernon, all the stars, Jimmy Gabriel, great. All the class players we had. Footballers, very different to today. And then we won the Cup in 66. And boy, I come out of Wembley that day. I tell you, I won some money. I had Liverpool win the league, five to two. Everton to win the cup, 14 to one, up and down and a pound double. 
and I come out of there with some money. That Derek Temple, I tell you, boy, he put the centre leading in my house. <laughs> but the other highlight was Liverpool winning the league. And Liverpool won the cup the year before, and I've seen that. But uh, in 66, after Everton had won the FA Cup, think of England. England won the World Cup. What more do you want in the 60s? Fantastic. In the 60s, I just couldn't wait for Saturday to come. In fact, none of my mates could. Saturday was such a special day to us because football was so important in our lives. I mean, of course, we're all young fellas. None of us had cars. But even that was an advantage because we'd go to the match on foot and, of course, that meant going to boozers that we were obviously well known in. Uh, the Albert at the back of the cop was one, obviously. Uh, the Salisbury. And, of course, the Blues. They went to the Blue House and, you know, pubs down by Goodison. And that was all part of the day. And it was so exciting because for the first time, and I'm talking about Reds and Blues now, for the first time, we both had teams we could be proud of. I mean, they had Addy Catterick as manager. And, of course, we'd been blessed. Shanks had arrived at the start of the 60s and given us this wonderful team. And it was such an incredible thing to get up on a Saturday morning and the clock started to tick on, on your Saturday and what you knew was going to be full of passion and glory and of course in Liverpool's case almost always a home win. In fact when I look back to the 60s now it wasn't so much like going to a football ground it it was more like it was more like going to a shrine. And it's a very good morning from your local radio station Radio Merseyside. Station boss's 34-year-old Michael Hancock, a former BBC newsman, asked him what problems he faced getting the station ready. Well, our work, and I suppose our problems, although uh, challenge is a better word, word began way back in uh, May. And it may seem a long time ago, but I've never known a summer go so quickly. Because the first thing we had to do was uh, recruit the staff and then train them. And in training the staff in local radio, what we're doing is creating a complete new radio animal, a man who can do absolutely everything. The BBC decided that music was playing a greater role in everyday life, so they set up eight experimental local radio stations. Radio Merseyside left the other seven for dead. Mind you, it had a few problems in the beginning. I think I'm right in saying they had people on land, sea and air on the opening day. They, they had someone on land at the pier head, they had someone out on the ferry boat, they had someone at the top of St John's Beacon. They queued in the first outside broadcast, top of St John's Beacon, over we go to our reporter. Sss. Well, I'm sorry, Let, let's go over to so-and-so on the ferry boat. Sss. Over to the third reporter. Sss. Disaster, really. That, that one's gone down in the history books, the opening day of Radio Merseyside, where they, they couldn't even get a signal from the top of St John's Beacon, the, the major landmark in the city centre. We're not a replacement for the pirates. Uh, they did an entirely different job, a job that Radio One is now doing, and uh, local radio is about local people and events, and it's a different form of communication. But of course we will have uh, some pop music, but it'll be local, good pop music. We've got a programme called Top Ten on Merseyside, uh, which we can assure you will be a month ahead of the national taste, at least. When Radio Merseyside began, it didn't have its own newsroom. I think there was one news producer or, or news editor. So the news service was provided by the Liverpool Echo. And when the journalists at the Echo wrote their stories for, for the paper, they, they would write the top copy. And then what's called technically the black, the carbon copy, would be kept probably on a spike or, or in a file. And at the end of the day, the news stories, and the, the news editor would then deliver these at the microphone. Uh, again, very different from the kind of local radio we have today. A corporation office block in St Thomas Street was its home, the sixth floor of a, a very anonymous council building. People used to wander into the front desk to pay their rates but didn't quite appreciate there was a radio station on the top floor. Um, and a staff of about 20 people producing really a bizarre kind of output. About four hours of local programmes a day but interspersed with national programmes coming from London. 
So you'd have the world at one, followed maybe by 15 minutes for um, dog lovers on Merseyside, and then listen with mother, and then maybe Terry Wogan or Pete Brady, someone like that. Uh, then another local news program, a couple of minutes of headlines, and then they'd switch to another network. So a, a very bizarre patchwork, really, N not the kind of local radio that we're familiar with in, in the 1990s. <laughs> BBC were quite right. Music was everywhere. Every pub, club and theatre featured an endless stream of bands and performers. Well, the flavour of the 60s was basically everybody had a job virtually. You could go into one job and out the next, you know, you weren't uh, worried about jobs. And the music, in actual fact, was what was the lifeblood of Liverpool. Bands all over the place, amateur bands, everybody was, was in a band. Uh, those who couldn't play basically tried to play, you know. Um, it was just an amazing sort of, like a dream looking back. Uh, at the time, it was just, you're just trying to do something all the time, you're trying to be part of something, and that was basically the, uh, the feel of the time, you know, it, the wanting to be a part of something, you know wanted to be involved in something. But uh, the lucky people who actually made it, um, not always the ones that actually hit the, the charts, the, the likes of the vampires, the, um, the Dresdens, people of that nature were sort of big around the local, uh, like New Brighton, Wallasey, or all the rest of it. You know, like, it wasn't just Liverpool. Wallasey and New Brighton had a very sort of big venture of groups. Again, in Wallasey, we used to have a lot of the, um, going, going quite back now, the Tommy Steele lookalike competitions in, in the, what then was sort of church halls or scout huts. And that was sort of like for the 59-ish, sort of like that. And a lot of people then were sort of like moving up and rock and roll was sort of in everybody's mind at the time. Um, Lonnie Donegan and, and people of that ilk. And so when these sort of like lookalike competitions came in the small um, towns, i.e. Wallace, New Brighton, etc., that was your, probably your first sort of glimpse at sort of rock and roll of people that actually looked um, like your heroes or whatever. And it sort of gave birth, apart from the, uh, the, the washdowns and the, the, you know, the bases and all the rest of it, it gave birth to, I want to be part of something like that. And then when the sort of the Mersey beat hit, which it started in a, uh, as I recall, a very sort of smallish way, the sort of the local groups and this, that and the other, but obviously the Beatles brought the whole thing to the fore. Well, most of it, I think people thought, what a lucky break. I mean, they were sort of plucked from obscurity, really, and it was an average band, really, up until the time that they sort of rocketed off. Uh, Jerry uh, Marsden and the pacemakers, they sort of like went along on, on the tailcoats, I suppose you could say, of, of the Beatles. And everybody else, like the Searchers, etc., they started sort of making it. Um, there were obviously the uh, Tony Jackson, who's a Liverpool guy. There was the local heroes, you see. And people started to make a name for themselves in the local area. And I think it sort of, as time went on, people got past thinking, oh, we might make it to the standard of the Beatles. But I think really there was only one, you know, room for one actually band of that nature to, to, to go on. So everybody else sort of like either copied it or they tried to sort of like make their own sound up. Merseyside was awash with musical talent, but one group sailed high above all others. Four lads who changed the sound of pop music and changed the world. Bob Waller was the DJ at the Cavern between 1961 and 67 and introduced the Beatles over 400 times. I went there when rock and roll was coming in and I started at the Cavern in January 61. And I continued at the Cavern until it went bust uh, in Feb 66. And that's a rather tragic story because uh, it was bad vibes all around when the coppers came in to lock the place up and sh shift the groups off the stage, stop the music, etc. 
So I got to know the cavern quite well during my time there. I did the lunch times, the evenings, the all-nighters. I got to know, know the Beatles from December 60, and they made such an impact upon me. I, I was doing other venues as well, and I got them into other venues. So I had to get them into the cavern, and I prevailed upon Ray McFall, who was the owner of the cavern at the time, uh, to book the Beatles for lunchtime sessions. Uh, Ray had a problem about putting groups on at lunchtimes because unlike today, in uh, 94, uh, most of the groups were working and they couldn't get time off work, you see, but the Beatles were an exception. They'd been to, ha they packed their jobs in such as they were, they'd been to Hamburg and they'd come back to virtually nothing. So they were glad of the work that the uh, cavern provided for them at lunchtime, tea evenings, etc. By the way, as a matter of interest, their first lunchtime session, which was in February 61, there were five Beatles then, Stuart Sutcliffe was with them. They got a, paid a pound per man, and they insisted on the driver, who was Neil Aspinall, getting a pound. So in total, they got six pounds. Now, I must relate that to their farewell performance two and a half years later when they played the cavern August the 3rd, a memorable date, Saturday, August 3rd, 63, and they got paid 300 pounds. Now, you may think perhaps, oh, that's not a mere nothing, a bagatelle, but in those days, in 63, it was quite a princely sum, and the idea of paying a group 300 pounds didn't occur to us at all. I can assure you, of course, things are totally different thereafter. The difference with the Beatles, we had about 350 groups on this scene in those days, and the difference between the Beatles and the rest was not their long hair, not their winkle pickers, not their leather jackets. It was the fact that they wrote their own songs. That was the most significant thing about the Beatles and they wrote outstanding songs which really none of the other groups could equal. Yes, Silver Black worked in the uh, cloakroom uh, for seven and six months, I think, a shift. Um, uh, and she used to ask me, uh, uh, when she did her stint in the, uh, in the cloakroom, she used to ask me if uh, she could get up and sing a few songs. But I had to be a uh, choosy uh, be careful which group was on stage because they had to know her songs. The big three knew her songs. Uh, Jerry uh, and the pacemakers knew her songs, and uh, King Size Taylor knew the, her songs as well. So it depended which group was on stage. It's funny, but everybody from Liverpool says they knew the Beatles. I knew the Beatles. <laughs> but I really did know the Beatles. <laughs> I've worked with them. This is true, I worked with them. Way back in the 60s, I remember one particular night, we were doing a club call, the Offerton Palace in Stockport. And we're on our way to Stockport, in the back of the van, Neil Aspinall driving. And John Lennon was writing down on the back of an envelope the songs that they were going to sing that night. And he's writing all the famous, well, they're famous songs now. And Ringo piped up and said, um, what about me? And John Lennon said, what, what about you? He said, well, I haven't got my song down. He said, well, I don't want your song down. He said, well, that's not fair. I haven't sung boys for ages. And John Lennon said, there's a very good reason why you haven't sung boys for ages, because it, you can't sing, and it's a rubbish song anyway, and you're not singing boys, and that's that. So Ringo just shut up. We got to off in Palace. It was packed with girls. I went on and did my stuff. I introduced the Beatles. The Beatles came on and did their stuff, and they started playing great until about a minute into the song, and obviously something wasn't right. And he looked round, and Ringo was sitting there, with his arms folded, and he hadn't brought his sticks on. And he just looked at them and he thought, I can't sing boys, well, to you. As the decade drew to a close, many new features to Merseyside life were receiving the finishing touches. New shops, offices, nightclubs, restaurants, even roads showed how much the city was on the move. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and Oliver were the opening attractions at the brand new Odeon Cinema, with Oliver star Mark Lester in attendance. It was a time when one and six would buy a pound of stork margarine. A loaf was one and tuppence halfpenny. 
A pound of middle back bacon was two and eight, and oranges were six pence, or two and a half new pence each. Even as a grandfather at 60 years of age nearly, I still have the respect for the city. I wouldn't do nothing to upset anything in it. I wouldn't make a show of Liverpool. It's the greatest place there is. I think so anyhow. I'm not worried what anyone else thinks. They have got their own opinions. I've got mine. I of newt and toe of frog, six spare ribs and a mazy fog. Ringo's ringlets, Lennon's larynx, glottal stop from Scylla's pharynx. Anyone who had the heart? One wet Nelly, an Ollie, and a Kewan, two large whites, and a mother's ruin. A footy boot, and a pint of ale, a warder's key from Walton Jail. The Liverpool Echo, the one o'clock gun, Punch and Judy, lots of fun. A smack in the gob, a clip on the ear. Sunday saltfish, it's the gear. A tickling stick from Nutty Ash. A dirty big dollop of sausage and mash. A stink bomb from the wizard's den. A splinter from the docker's pen. Stare it up and feed the house. Good God, Maggie, we've invented Scouse. The country's prime minister, two of the nation's greatest football teams, industry working flat out, tens of millions spent on new roads and new developments, the arts and theatre bursting with new talent, and the world's greatest ever pop group. Not bad for one city, but that was Merseyside in the 60s.